Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we'd like to welcome Patricia Johnson. She's going to be presenting on hearing management TS. And so, Patricia, I'll let you go ahead and start. Thank you so much for having me. I've been able to participate with the North Carolina Turner Syndrome Society. And so this is a, a really a wonderful opportunity to talk to more of you about my specialty, which is the management of hearing loss. I'm a professor at UNC, but I spend most of my time seeing adult patients and then I teach some of the courses in the doctoral program. So part of what I'm gonna to share today is related to my clinical expertise, but also my personal experience as a mother of two children whose eardrums cannot stay intact. So hopefully you can benefit from my personal experience as well. I'm not gonna get into the genetics of, uh, of TS because I know that is well covered in some of your other sessions, but this shocks gene that gets a lot of attention is so crucial to prenatal development that has implications on the ear, partly because our inner ear forms within the first few weeks of gestation. And that can have implication on how the middle ear bones form, eustachian tube, which we'll look at, and possibly also later premature aging in the hair cells of the cochlea. So hold on to this. We're going to review this together. So here we have a picture of the ear, both inside and out. And just as a brief walk through, we perceive sound through a sequence of events that have to happen in perfect sequence like dominoes falling in order for us to perceive sound. And if one of the dominoes is interrupted, we call that a hearing loss. So what I do when I'm diagnosing a hearing loss is trying to determine where along the auditory pathway is there a problem so that we can provide the correct type of treatment. Sound waves are out in the environment. They're funneled in through the ear canal, assuming there's not a blockage here. Hits the eardrum, which vibrates. There's little bones that are attached to the back end of the eardrum itself that rock back and forth. And up until this point, sound has been a mechanical displacement, but once it reaches this snail shell, it turns into a fluid sloshing back and forth, which stimulates little hair fibers, and now it becomes a neural impulse, travels up the auditory nerve, and our brain takes it from there. So as you can see, this is a complex system. The more I learn about the ear, the more I'm amazed that we hear it all, but it also means that it's a delicate system. And as I've already said, interruptions will result in a hearing loss. We break hearing loss into two primary categories, conductive or sensory neural, and then we call it mixed if you have a little bit of both. So let's walk through first conductive hearing loss. This is an obstruction or a mechanical breakdown of either the ear canal or the middle ear space itself. An audiologist can diagnose uh, conductive hearing loss, but we're very quickly going to refer to a physician for medical evaluation because that's where the treatment is going to be, depending on the type of uh, cause. Because a con conductive hearing loss frequently can be corrected by removing the blockage if it's just earwax, medicine like antibiotics if it's an ear infection, or if there's actually something structurally wrong with the little ear bones, a surgery. And I have a good friend who no longer has ear bones because of something called a cholesteatoma that has eroded away and eaten away those little bones. And instead he has a titanium rod, a prosthetic in that space to transmit the sound. So there's really wonderful surgery that can be done. And as I've already listed, these are the most common examples of a conductive hearing loss. But what I'm gonna focus in on is, is ear infections because for families uh, with children with TS, or if you're an adult and you've made it through childhood with TS, chances are you probably had multiple ear infections. We also call that otitis media. I make a distinction between otitis media, meaning middle here, space versus otitis externa, which is more of the canal. That would be your swimmer's ear. The symptoms of an ear infection are usually well known. The child is complaining of their ear hurting. If the child is not yet verbal, they may be pulling on their ear. A lot of times they're just screaming for no reason and you're not really sure where the pain is coming from. Very common to also be running a fever, having some drainage from the nose, your typical cold symptoms. If the pressure behind the eardrum is so great and the pus that is building in that middle ear space 
gets to a point where it actually pops, you will see then fluid and drainage coming out of the ear. And I have some pictures coming of my own children, so stay tuned. Um, and if it's really bad, there might even be an odor in the ear. So this is something you definitely need to go straight to your pediatrician and or your primary care physician for them to look in the ear and prescribe the appropriate medicine. But if this is reoccurring and happening frequently, not only is the child or adult uncomfortable, but it can cause usually temporary hearing loss. And I'll look into that more. Well, why do we get these ear infections? It's not coming from the canal, not this type of ear infection. It's actually bacteria traveling up through the eustachian tube. So this tube connects your middle ear cavity to the nose and the throat. And a lot of times that's where the, the nastiness is actually residing. And as it drains and it's coming down, it then travels up the wrong tube into the eustachian tube, festers, gets inflamed, fills with nasty pus, and then it pushes on the eardrum. And that's why it hurts so much because there's so many nerve endings there. Now we've all probably experienced temporary moments of pressure change. You're going up in an airplane, you're dropping down an elevation, but if it's sustained and it's pushing on the eardrum, it is very unpleasant. Children of any background are more likely to have ear infections than adults because the eustachian tube uh, in infancy and childhood is kind of in a bit of a horizontal position, allowing the bacteria from the nose and the throat to more easily travel to the middle ear space. And then as they mature, it becomes more of a vertical position. So stuff is like less likely to, to travel. But as I've already said, the eustachian tubes is that channel and it's we it's good we have eustachian tubes it's supposed to be opening and closing to equalize the pressure of the middle ear space but if it's doing a bad job because it's inflamed or letting bacteria in that's usually the cause of ear infections so treatment can be varied it's going to depend on the severity of the child's discomfort so a lot of times it's just watch and wait once the head cold clears the ear infection will resolve on its own but when your child is screaming night after night you were gonna to wanna to do something about it, and which is why your primary care physician or pediatrician will prescribe antibiotics. And I know my children have had so many ear infections, we're having to kind of go straight to the higher dose of um, kind of the nastier antibiotics because the other ones are stopped being effective. That's a whole separate topic. PE tubes, pressure equalization tubes is a common treatment. We're gonna look at that in just a minute. And I'm gonna say maybe hearing aids, but that wouldn't be the first line of defense for a conductive hearing loss because we would wanna treat the underlying infection first. As I've already said, ear infections are incredibly common with Turner syndrome. Uh, the rates I keep seeing in the literature says about 50% and they usually are coming back over and over again, which is frustrating. It's, it takes kids out of school because they're uncomfortable, um, fevers, et cetera. And it becomes a concern for language learning and education if they're frequent enough that the child is not hearing well. And as I've already said, the rates of in ear infection will decrease as the child matures. Although there are plenty of adults who are still getting ear infections because their structure of their, their neck, throat, and ear stays a little bit um, different where they're still getting bacteria through. You've, this was said well earlier uh, in the previous session, but in cases of conductive hearing loss, monitoring and frequent management with your uh, pediatrician is gonna be very important in childhood. You're gonna need probably more frequent checkups. And that I like the idea of that annual hearing test with the audiologist to make sure that that fluid is draining, that there isn't gonna be an impact on speech and language, but also for parents to be vigilant about it as well. So now I'm gonna step into my mommy hat because I have two young children and they are following my childhood, which was ear infection, ear infection, ear infection, more ear infections, tubes, 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 tubes. Um, this, the picture on the left is my child, my daughter when she was an infant with a ruptured eardrum. And this other picture is only from a few weeks ago of my son with a ruptured ear, uh, eardrum. So what you'll see is your child will be screaming in the night and you're not entirely sure what's wrong. My children never run fevers when they have ear infections. But then in the morning, they seem to be doing fine. You're getting ready to take them to school or daycare. And this is what you'll see. You'll see crust. <laughs> you'll see nasty crust lining the canal of the ear. It's now draining its way out. 
um, maybe it has a little bit of an odor, but this is not earwax. Earwax does not drain out like this and crust. It's a ruptured eardrum. And they are actually more prone to their eardrums rupturing more frequently because of their past ear infections. Their hole in their eardrum will heal, but it stays thin. It doesn't, it's not as strong as what the original membrane was. And so then it takes less pressure to kind of reopen it back up. Your child feels a lot better once their eardrum ruptures. <laughs> I'm really honest with you, but obviously we don't want to keep doing this. Um, you would need to be taking your child in to see the physician for proper treatment. So we don't want the eardrum to necessarily keep ripping on its own. That's not a good strategy for managing this pressure. You would want to consider uh, with the consultation of an ear, nose and throat physician, ear tubes, also called in tympanostomy, PE tubes, ventilation tubes. It is like a little plastic grommet that is placed under general anesthesia into the eardrum itself. And now we have an opening that isn't the eustachian tube to let that pressure release, to let that drainage happen in a more controlled way. The child's gonna feel a lot better. And these are temporary, they, are, they don't stay in. They're actually designed to come out of the ear canal at some point. The ear is gonna be naturally trying to heal itself and it will spit it out at some point and heal over. Might leave a little bit of scar tissue, but that's okay. And then eventually the tube will fall out of the ear or your pediatrician might fish it out at some point. So these are some, uh, a picture of what this tube actually looks like. Uh, they might be green or blue, et cetera. And they're creating some ventilation for the pressure to stop building. Now with my children, I have their hearing frequently tested because of these ear infections. And I'd wanna make sure that we're not setting ourselves up for any kind of speech and language delays. So the, my, this is my daughter on the right, age five. And when we are doing pediatric hearing tests, the audiologist in her case is actually on the other side of the booth with the equipment presenting tones and words through headphones. And when she hears the tone, she pushes the fake button and then they reward her if she was right with Elsa appearing on a computer screen. So this is pretty high tech <laughs> called conditioned play audiometry here where she is conditioned to hear the sound and press the fake button and Elsa pops up in all her glory and she's reinforced to keep on responding to the sound. Now my son, he is watching her hearing test eagerly awaiting his turn because if it's good enough for her, it's good enough for him. He's three and a half. We need to be a little more involved with pediat uh, younger kiddos. And so in his case, they're playing a game where he holds the connects for piece to his ear. And every time he hears it, he drops it into the hole and they can get all the testing they need through this method. Um, I am not a pediatric audiologist. I have great respect for what they do. They are so good at getting the data that they need at any age and with any developmental level. Um, they have ways of modifying the tasks for children. And of course, an adult doesn't get toys. When we test your hearing, you have to just press a button or raise your hand. So this is both of my children's hearing. And I show you, because this is what chronic otitis media with effusion looks like. Effusion sometimes is called glue ear, where there's just fluid always there and doesn't seem to resolve very well. This is the audiogram, it represents hearing sensitivity with the blue X's being the left ear and the red circles are the right ear. For a child, we would want these little symbols to be at 15 decibels or above. And if the symbols are below 15, which you can see is happening here in these low bass tones, that's a hearing loss. And what both of my children have frequently is a little bit of low bass pitch hearing loss. Now, thankfully, neither of my children are having speech and language delays. So at this point, the appropriate treatment was to continue to monitor the amount of fluid in their ear, keep up with the ear tubes, et cetera. I would not fit hearing aids on my child because of the whole you know, picture of, of how they are functioning. But I actually was just in a presentation yesterday talking about Children with mild hearing loss sometimes do need to move forward with hearing aids earlier than an adult would because of the risk of, of learning delays. And so you need to know your child, how much effort is going into their learning and support them however necessary. But in general, a hearing uh, loss like this is temporary. It should resolve at some point. So ear tubes for everyone. My 
five-year-old is on her third set and my son is on his second because as I've said, they're temporary. They get spit out at some point and then you're back to more ear infections until you put another tube in. So it feels endless. They are going to grow out of it. The picture on my left is my daughter on her first birthday, her actual birthday, getting her first set of tubes. And then on the right is her at five, getting her, her next set of tubes at the same time baby brother is. And they've not updated the, uh, the scrubs <laughs> for children, the little jammies. Still have little tigers on them. The pediatric hospitals are wonderful at making your children feel comfortable and you feel comfortable with the process. Uh, this is my son directly after he had his tubes placed. There's a little bit of cotton in his ear. He came out of the anesthesia great. He's just like, give me that popsicle, I don't care. My five-year-old was a little more upset. That's not common. She was feeling a little disoriented and we kind of held her for a little while, but they both walked out. This, For those uh, ENT surgeons who are doing this procedure, it takes them less than five minutes. They use a tiny scalpel to cut a hole. They suck out using a vacuum, all the nastiness, and then they place that little grommet in. Now I put here my son's ear in the following 24 hours. You're gonna expect pus and stuff coming out. He had a little more blood coming out of his ear than I typically see or would have liked to see, but I did what you would do. I called the on-call ENT and said, is this normal? Should I be, I'm, an, I'm an audiologist. Should I be worried about this? And they basically said, no, it sounds pretty normal. Let us know if it's still actively draining, you know, that bloody pus by the next day. And it wasn't, it was fine. You're going to be given Cipridex, most likely, which is a sterile uh, antibiotic uh, drop to be able to put into the ear canal, usually seven to 10 days um, in the evening, right before bed into both ears. We want to keep the tubes open. And one thing that I've done with my kids, because we get so many of these ear infections, I have a standing order where I can keep placing updated prescription of those drops. And as soon as my kids are complaining of ear pain, if I'm seeing any kind of drainage, even weeks, months after the tubes were placed, we have the drops on hand to be able to place them. So work with your physician team to see if there's something you can already have on hand, but please do not put anything else in the ear other than what is prescribed. That's really important to avoid other types of outer ear infections. This is a, a study which actually has a surprisingly high number of test participants. As you know how rare it is, it's hard to get really good end numbers. But what they found for children is that they do have greater rates of hearing loss. It's usually conductive, it's usually those ear infections, or it might be ear infections plus sensory neural, which is what we're gonna look at next. Now, just because you have a greater rate is not a guarantee that you yourself are gonna have hearing loss or your child's going to have hearing loss, but we need to uh, manage it. We need to keep an eye on it and then be prepared to act if we need to. All right, so that was my personal experience with OME and it's, it's not over yet, I'm still in the thick of it. Let's go ahead and now move deeper into the ear system to the cochlea, which is now where we talk about the secondary type of hearing loss, sensory neural. Because if we think about sort of the lifespan, the OME, the ear infections is typically what you're gonna see in childhood, but then there's gonna become a point in, in adolescence and early adulthood where now our radar needs to shift to be thinking about sensory neural hearing loss. Sensory neural hearing loss is caused by degeneration of little tiny hair cells in the inner ear and or some kind of impact of the auditory nerve that comes after it. And some symptoms of this type of hearing loss is that speech sounds muffled. It sounds unclear. It can happen very subtle or very subtly, very gradually over time where we stop being aware of some of the peripheral sounds that we're not hearing as well. But what tends to go first is soft, high-pitched sounds, the turn signal in a car, hearing the ding of the microwave hearing leaves crunch underfoot outside are these soft everyday sounds. There's the characteristic, what, huh, can you repeat it? So you're, you're getting sound, but because it's unclear, because it sounds muffled, you're needing more repetition. You're using more lip reading, more of your eyes to support what you're hearing. And then what's very, very classic in my patients is I can hear in quiet, but as soon as I'm in noise, like forget about it. I'm really, really struggling. The treatment is gonna follow the severity of the loss. And of course, hearing aids are 
a way of providing amplified sound in a controlled way. I'm going to talk about hearing aids more in a little bit. There are other assistive devices that are not hearing aids that are particularly useful for a mild hearing loss where we're not quite ready for hearing aids, but even just putting captioning on the television or using Bluetooth headphones to get the sound more directly into your ears can help bridge the gap until we're ready for more advanced technology. And for those who have progressed to the point where you no longer can benefit from hearing aids at all, too many of the hair fibers are gone, we would refer you for a cochlear implant. And I'm not gonna talk about that today unless I get a question about it because it's kind of a really for most of the severe profound losses. There's our cochlea. It's encased in bone, but filled with fluid and little membranes. And these are the actual hair cells themselves, or really they're little tips of them that are sticking out of the membrane. When they're healthy, they stick straight up in neat little rows. And they're almost like seaweed in the ocean, whereas the fluid gets displaced, they're stimulated, and then it's perceived as a neural response. They're also tonotopic, meaning that some of these hair cells are tuned for low bass sounds, and some of them are tuned for high pitch sounds, treble sounds, which is really just incredible. But that means that depending on which hair cells are damaged, that changes how you perceive those different pitches. A damaged hair cell will look like this, and this picture always makes me sad. As you can see, they're kind of splayed out, they're kind of bent, they're broken, and at a certain point, if they're missing, it's a real problem because we will be amplifying the sound through a hearing aid and presenting it to these hair cells. But if they are not there, and if they cannot receive it, then what is sent up to the auditory system is distorted, is incomplete. And I, I could actually talk for an hour on this slide alone because this explains why success with, or one of the many reasons why success with hearing aids is really variable. While you have one person who says, I'm doing great with my hearing aids. It's brought me back to full function. It's like I'm 20 again. And then someone else goes, I just am never able to adapt to them. It doesn't sound right. It sounds distorted. It sounds unclear. Now, lots of things can go into that, but it could be that they have fundamentally different hearing loss. There is no one hearing loss. It's a spectrum, um, and we need to make sure that the treatment is appropriate and well fit. And unless you're a bird or a frog, I cannot regrow these hair cells. They're trying. They're injecting ears with all sorts of crazy stuff to try to, to grow them back, but we are, are born with a finite number of them. <clears throat> An acquired sensory neural hearing loss is something that any of us can uh, achieve <laughs> over our lifetime. It could be ototoxicity, meaning that drugs that we've needed to take for our other health conditions are actually negatively impacting those hair cells are toxic to them. Noise exposure is something we all can actually prevent. So you should be protecting your hearing. There's some literature to suggest that those with turners are actually more susceptible to noise damage, that their hair, hair cells are more delicate. So if you don't have a pair of earplugs in your purse, start carrying them and also be thinking about what noise you can avoid. Um, and certainly if you are in occupational noise, you should be really diligent about protecting your hearing there. This is for everyone. But when we think about turners, there's quite a few studies to suggest that those women are seeing hearing loss earlier in adulthood than we would have expected for just age-related hearing loss alone, and that it possibly is progressing faster. So here's where that monitoring is really important. And I would say, starting in your 20s, you should be monitoring your hearing, not, oh, I'll think about that when I'm 65. That would be way too late to be monitoring, monitoring this type of hearing loss. And what's also a little bit unusual about a general statement we can make about the hearing loss that we see is that it seems to impact the middle pitches more than a standard age-related hearing loss. So here's another audiogram. This is from a study by Rausch et al. Um, and what you see here is, again, the left ear is the X's, the right ear are the circles, and each of those symbols represent the time that this person in the booth raised their hand. 20 decibels is the cutoff of normal hearing for adults. And any one of these symbols that were, is uh, marked here at below 20 decibels is a hearing loss. And in this case, they actually have worse hearing right in the middle of the graph. That's unusual. We typically see the high-pitched treble tones impacted first. And then another study from 2017, they found that in general, 
women with Turner syndrome seem to have hearing like those who are 20 years older, so of the general population. So their hearing looks 20 years older than their actual age. So that's that possible early onset, but also a little bit faster progression that we need to be keeping an eye on. This was a newer study that was also looking at the clinical update on sensory neural hearing loss. And they gave just two class examples of the type of hearing loss that they're seeing. This example on the left is someone around 21 years old. Most of the hearing is still normal, but here's some of that middle pitch uh, starting to drop out. And then over here is an example of someone who's 44 with more higher frequency hearing loss that has now progressed. And that is a lot more hearing loss that I would typically see with someone who's 44. So, and, and this person is certainly gonna start perceiving this in their speech understanding because what's happening in the treble tones and the high pitches is a lot of our consonants like S, SH, TH, SH, S, and TH. It's hard to make TH very loud. Those particular sounds in speech are contributing most to speech clarity and speech distinction between words. So if you're not getting good access to them, it's gonna sound like people are mumbling. So probably the 21 year old over here on the left isn't really aware that they have a hearing loss, but the person by 44, certainly I would have hoped it would in our, in our office already. There was a, re we're gonna talk about hearing aids in a minute, but I wanted to specifically talk about cerumen management. I got this request. I do a lot of wax removal <laughs> and uh, as well as do your, your pediatricians. And I just wanna talk a little bit about what you can and can't do in terms of safe management before we talk about hearing aids. Back to the ear again. Earwax is healthy and good. It is not a sign of poor hygiene. It's actually your ear canal trying to clean itself. It is a self-cleaning system. And wax is a mixture of a fatty lipid oily substance that's secreted almost like sweat glands and mixed together with dead skin cells. It creates these balls of glob that are then actually trying to migrate out of the ear canal like a conveyor belt but wax is only produced in that outer half, kind of where the arrow is. If wax gets pushed into the inner half, it's just gonna sit there because the, the conveyor belt mechanism is no longer there to help you. And you probably need a professional now to scoop, pull, suck, or rinse the wax out of your ear. So when we talk about management, here are the things not to do. And some of this you've probably heard before, don't put anything in your ear smaller than your elbow. Well, that's true. We all use Q-tips. I mean, I'm willing to admit it, but the problem with Q-tips is that we think we're scooping and pulling and we're actually pushing and pressing. And like I said, if it gets in that inner half of the ear, it's not coming out without help. And there's lots and lots of cases of people accidentally bumping it too far and you can rupture your eardrum this way and or I've had folks who've caused their ear canals to bleed because they were scraping so hard. The skin is very thin in the ear canal. Please do not waste your time with any type of a vacuum, any type of thing that looks like a corkscrew that has lots of little uh, spoon handles. There's some really creative options out there. They are a waste of time and are probably dangerous. When I suction wax out of someone's ear, there's a whole cart with a motor in it. That's how much pressure you need behind it. These little battery operated things are doing nothing. And then ear candling is a hoax. Please don't bother with ear candling either. It is more likely to set your hair on fire. The warmth feels nice in the ear canal. It feels sort of comforting, but it is also not creating any kind of a suction. It's not melting anything that's coming out of the ear, particularly, I mean, this angle is just nuts, but it's doing nothing. And if you were to burn an ear candle just on a plate at the table and cut it open, you will see the same contents as if you had burned it actually touching your head because it's just burning and melting its insides. So please do, please do not use ear candling. So what can you do? The biggest thing I'm gonna say, which is very unsatisfactory is please just leave it alone. Like <laughs> Leave it alone. Unless you know that it's a problem, most of us actually are making the problem worse by trying to treat it. So just use a tissue on your finger to clean the very outer edge of the ear to get what is sort of unsightly, but the rest you should leave alone. If you are an older child or an adult, you can safely use some over-the-counter drops 
that are hydrogen peroxide based to loosen the wax. Nothing is melting the wax, it's loosening it up. Some people will use a little bit of baby oil, mineral oil to again, keep the wax soft. And if you feel very comfortable and have an okay from your physician, a little bit of light rinsing also with a bulb syringe. But if you have tubes in your ears, you, you cannot be using any of those methods. I had a patient once who did not know that he had a hole in his eardrum. I didn't know either. And he used some hydrogen peroxide in the ear and you better believe it, it stung like the dickens. So this is, these are not options for you if you know you have a hole in the eardrum or have tubes and or any in history of swimmer's ear. Ideally, you should be leaving this up to a professional. Ask at all your doctor's visits, can you please look in my child's ears? Because they may not have to be thinking about it or have time for it because they're looking at other health systems. So ask, ask your audiologist, ask your physician to look in your ears regularly, and we have the proper tools to do it. We will assess your risk. We can make sure we got it out um, and give you uh, more tailored recommendations. So in our remaining time, I wanna go through seven steps of better hearing for those of you <clears throat> with sensory neural hearing loss, particularly. It always starts with discussing your difficulty with your physician. You probably need a referral from your doctor to have us be able, the audiologist, bill for your hearing test. And if this is a child, you need to be seen in the context of probably ENT, as well as the audiologist. Schedule that comprehensive hearing test if it's been a few years or if you've never gotten a baseline, there's no time like the present. Make sure that it's a licensed doctor of audiology. You can get free hearing tests at all sorts of hearing stores, but they are not medical professionals needs to be a calibrated booth. They need to be testing both these tones as well as speech. <clears throat> and then we will make the appropriate medical referral as needed. Who can fit hearing aids? Excuse me, I'm getting kind of froggy. <clears throat> well, audiologist can, that's me. I am a dispensing audiologist. I do fit hearing aids. It's a four-year undergraduate degree and then a four-year doctorate degree. We are medical professionals, although we are not physicians, so I will refer when appropriate. But we test and treat both the hearing and the balance systems in adults and children. We are the only ones licensed to be working with children. You are also maybe aware of other types of dispensers known as hearing aid dispensers or hearing instrument specialists. The education level of these um, individuals depends on your state. It's usually a minimum of a high school diploma or an associate's degree one-year apprenticeship, and then they pass a licensing exam to sell hearing aids. They are legally only allowed to work with adults. If you're considering your care, one fundamental question you should ask yourself is that, do you want to be a patient seen in the context of medical care? Which I'm gonna say right now, if you already know you have Turner syndrome or your child does, you should be a patient. You should be seen in the context of medical care because of all your other health systems that may be come into play. The other option is to decide to be a consumer when it comes to hearing aids. And that is a whole other topic of whether a hearing aid is a consumer or electronic or whether it's a medical device. The device that's selected for you should be entirely tailored to your treatment plan and what it is you want that device to do. There are different styles of hearing aids in the ear, over the ear, rechargeable, Bluetooth. The cost of the hearing aid is determined by the computer chip that's on the inside of the hearing aid. And then there's all course going to be attributed services alongside of just the device to make sure that it's fit. Sometimes there's service plans, repair plans. Find out exactly what is included and what is not at the time that you're being fit. But if you do not feel comfortable in the way that the hearing aid is being sold to you, or feel like that there is a uh, financial incentive involved, leave. Find a health care professional who is working more in a medical center and you'll likely get um, a less retail focused process. Children are almost always fit with a behind the ear style hearing aid like you see here that has a custom made mold. And that's because we can keep the hearing aid itself with all the electronics the same. And as the child grows, we, all we have to do is replace the mold that fits their ear. Um, but this is all gonna depend on both preference and acoustically what we need to achieve for the hearing loss. Once the hearing aids are ordered, there's a fitting. You should be taught how to properly take care and maintain your hearing aid. There's always cleaning involved. 
The audiologist connects your hearing aids to software where we manipulate the sound to make sure that you're getting the right amount of sound at those different pitches. Hearing aids are only as good as the programming in them. And I'm gonna say it again, hearing aids are only good as the programming. So unfortunately, I do have examples of folks coming to my office who've been fit and they've spent a lot of money on hearing aids, but if they were never programmed properly, they might be almost useless. At the same time, I have patients that I have fit with very inexpensive hearing aids, but used all best fit and they're wonderfully effective. So when you are choosing your hearing care, you really need to choose your provider over any one device because somebody has to tell the hearing aid what to do. This particular process is something that you should write down if you are planning to order hearing aids, already have hearing aids, considering hearing aids in the future. It's called real ear verification, sometimes called speech mapping. What I do when I fit a hearing aid is I put a very small microphone in my patient's ear. I then put the hearing aid over top of it. Now, by having a microphone in the ear, I can measure what the patient is hearing in real time. I can see what they hear. That is the only way that I know that if I've, I've achieved a proper fitting. Is it fit correctly? Is it safe? And I follow a prescription. I'm not just making up numbers. I have a prescription that I follow that takes the burden off the patient to tell me what they think it should sound like which is not very good medicine. So if you have never had this done to your hearing aids, if you already wear them, if you're considering it for the first time, this is what you should be asking your, the provider you're considering. Do you do real ear verification? Because if they're not, they're not doing best practice. And unfortunately, less than 50% of people who sell hearing aids are doing this process. And if it's a child who's being fit with a hearing aid, I mean, it's basically unethical to not be doing it because what's What's a two-year-old gonna tell you about their hearing aids? Nothing. We have to have a way that is objective to know what is safe in the ear. So if children need to be seen by an audiologist, one, ideally a pediatric audiologist, and alongside of an ear, nose, and throat physician. Very, very important. There's usually a trial period, so you need to be working with your audiologist to come back for follow-up visits. This is a really crucial part of this. Hearing aids are not like glasses. Glasses are pretty instantaneous. You can put them on and you, nobody has to train your brain how to see better. That is the case with hearing loss. I consider hearing aids to be a tool within a rehabilitative process where it's like ear therapy, especially if someone's already gone several years not hearing well, I need to now retrain them to hear. And how you hear the first day with your hearing aid isn't how you hear a month later. There's an adaptation period that has to happen. So please work along with your audiologist to help you overcome the initial hurdle of getting used to hearing aids so that you can be successful. And then even after you're doing well, there are gonna be routine follow-ups. Hearing aids have to be cleaned, they have to be repaired. So I recommend seeing your audiologist every six months. And then lastly, on these steps to hearing better, I highly recommend oral rehabilitation, which is basically counseling related to communication that is tailored to you. This should be part of your treatment plan. There are support groups. The Hearing Loss Associ Association of America is wonderful. Um, classes, my clinic has a YouTube channel where we provide our oral rehabilitation online. Um, educate yourself about hearing loss because hearing aids are not a cure for hearing loss until I can regrow the ear from the inside, the hearing aid is a tool. And I'm using the, the technology the best that I can, but it's not gonna solve all problems. So we probably need to be more holistic. How do I know if I need a hearing, a hearing aid? It may be your friends and family that bring it up to you first, that they notice that you're not hearing as well. You yourself may notice that people are mumbling and not speaking as clearly as they used to. We've already talked about hearing and noise tends to be a, a first uh, thing that folks will notice. And maybe you're having to increase the volume of your television, et cetera, in order to hear better. For children, we're looking at their behavior and we're also looking at their speech and language and whether they're having any- He's on else already. I'm sorry, I heard just someone's voice. But the goal with hearing aids is that we would not 
end up in a place where people are not participating in their own life. If the hearing loss is a barrier to you, your social activities, the classes and things that are important to you, then we need to treat the problem and sooner is better. So in summary, before we move on to questions for children, ear infections are incredibly common. It comes with the territory, even if you do not have Turner syndrome, uh, we need to be testing hearing regularly and working probably with an ear, nose and throat physician on the best way to manage those ear infections. Most conductive loss is temporary, but if it's frequent enough, it can start to impact language learning. And so we wanna make sure that we're managing it well. For adults, the research suggests that you're at greater risk for early onset progressive hearing loss that's gonna move a little bit faster than we typically see. So if you already know you have a hearing loss, you should be tested annually. If you have not yet been detected for every two to three years is probably fine, but please go in as soon as you think that there's a problem. Because hearing loss is a barrier to people. It cuts us off from social relationships, from quality of life, and it can start to impact your emotional well-being. So please don't wait so long to treat it. We've got great options. We have, there are affordable options. There are attractive options. We can make them Bluetooth headphones now. We're trying to make them cool. Uh, so please work with an audiologist uh, if you are having any concerns. This is my contact information. My email is here. I'm a professor of audiology and I love answering questions. So I do hope if we don't have time to answer all of them today that you would reach out to me. And I'm in central North Carolina if you're near me. And with that, I'm gonna open up the floor for questions. Thank you for your attention. Hi, Patricia. We have a question <clears throat> from the audience, and she says that she has sensory neural hearing loss and related tinnitus, which causes um, a lot of difficulty with her sleeping. And she wants to know if there's anything that can be done to treat tinnitus that it might especially help her sleep. Yeah. So sensory neural hearing loss, and I'm going to say tinnitus, audiologists typically say tinnitus. Tinnitus is incredibly common, and it the tinnitus is a symptom and the hearing loss is a symptom of the same thing, which is damage to those little hair cells in most cases. And when is it worse? It's worse when you're in perfectly quiet environments because now you're not busy, you're not active. There isn't other noise around you to sort of mix and, and cover over the tinnitus. So sleep is, is a really common uh, thing to be impacted. If you haven't already, get one of those white noise machines. There are also apps you can download on your phone that generate different types of noise. And it may not be that you don't want to hear shh, you know, white, true white noise, maybe ocean waves, maybe rainfall. It's whatever works to give your brain something else to focus on other than the sound itself. There's also something called the sound pillow, which has a speaker inside the pillow itself that can generate these types of noises. So this is what we call sound therapy. I can't make the tinnitus go away, but can I help my brain not hyper-focus on it and find something that's more relaxing to mix with the tinnitus? Okay, thank you. Then another question is, <clears throat> um, she says that I know a lot of kids have to get multiple ear tubes multiple times. Will this impact their hearing? And she's also heard of the holes from the tubes not completely healing, causing pain. So it's very common to need tubes multiple times. And that's why I shared my children's story, which is not over yet. My, my five-year-old's on her third set because they're made to be temporary. They work their way out sometimes sooner than you wish they would. After her first tube, she had a 25% hole in her eardrum, meaning that of her eardrum, a quarter of it was actually just a big hole. And it actually delayed us being able to put a tube back in when we needed to. And yet it actually was acting like a tube. And I talked to the ENT and I said, is this going to be a problem? Is it going to close? And he basically said, I don't know. <laughs> but, we're, but we wouldn't even worry about it until she's at least seven. So starting to get to more adult size head and, and then some other maturation. But what he did at some point in a later surgery, he, he kind of roughed up the edges of the hole, which stimulated new growth. And it healed over. I, I actually didn't think it would. Having a hole in the eardrum in and of itself is not painful. It's only if there's recurring active infections and an inflammation that there's pain. But just having a hole in your eardrum and it's kind of turned into scar tissue is actually very livable. I have patients with permanent holes in their eardrum and they live normal lives. 
it just comes down to whether it's a dry hole, we call it a dry perf, where it's not just actively oozing. That's the problem. If it's just dry in there, it's not a problem. And depending on the size of the hole will determine if there's also hearing loss present, but just having a hole in and of itself is not, does not equal hearing aids. Other okay, questions? here's one, here's one other one, maybe a little more complicated. She says that I'm deaf in my left ear. I think the nerve is not connected. Also, the membrane is between the, is in between the ear parts and bone is missing. Can anything mm -hmm. be corrected? So this is going to be really specific then to your anatomy and what is there. And it does, that does sound complicated. I would want to be evaluated for a cochlear implant because a cochlear implant is not producing acoustic sound. It's using electricity at the level of the cochlea. So you can have no ear canal, you can have no eardrum, and you can have basically no hair cells left and the cochlea doesn't, or the implant doesn't care because it comes into that snail shell and it's using electrical impulses to stimulate the nerve. And because it's tonotopic, because it's laid out like a piano, low to high pitches, depending on which electrode you stimulate, they perceive different sound. So that would be what I would want for you would be to, to go in and probably they need to do really close imaging of your head, which maybe they already have if they know that um, that's there, see if a cochlear implant works. Now, if you have no nerve, that is sometimes a different story because the cochlea needs to be attached to the brain in some way. And so either insufficient nerve or a missing nerve, that's a pretty complex situation. And sometimes in those cases, an implant helps a little bit, but not as much as someone else. So that's gonna really be down to you and your surgical team to decide that. that one? I was, I guess on that same note, for those who have a deaf ear, and, and an ear that works. There are other non-surgical options. I can't give sound to the dead ear, but I can transmit it to the better ear using something called a cross, contralateral routing of the signal. It looks like a pair of hearing aids, but the one on the dead side is just sending the sound over for my better ear to hear. And so that would be something else to try. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. And um, <clears throat> we're going to be um, ending this session now. And we'll resume again at 2 o'clock for the next session. So you should uh, redirect back into the lobby. And we'll see you shortly. All right. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Just